Hello and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on a Friday evening. And I think there are very few Fridays on which uh, it is possible to have. So uh, I know it is a bad situation out there, but somehow let's try and make the best out of it. We have like fantastic panelists here. Uh, before I go to the panel, a very quick introduction about myself and about the session. Uh, my name is Praveen. I work uh, and lead a CSF strategy work, and I've been working with a Central Sphere Foundation, which is a philanthropic foundation working on school education for about six years now. Uh, given that this is the last session uh, for the day, I thought what it might be useful for it to be like visualized as a kind of a summary panel for the discussion that we are having throughout the day. So if some of you who've attended other sessions would have talked about how right from Ashish and Rukmini's session to talk about like high level uh, uh, macro uh, issues related to COVID, to thinking very deeply about how teachers, how organizations are responding to it. I thought this might be a panel where we could almost consolidate all of that learning uh, and have the leadership of some of the most prominent not-for-profits talk a little bit about A, how are they thinking about this entire unprecedented situation affecting the ecosystem that they work in. So for example, how is it affecting their projects? How is it affecting the kind of work that they're doing in the community? So that's at one level. Moving from there to a little bit talking about organization as a whole and internal. It is a challenging time for the not-for-profit sector. Uh, how are some of these leaders managing both that transition as well as uncertainty? And then I would want to ask them a little bit about at a personal level, how are they trying to keep sane, guiding, navigating, managing the entire organization, if at all that is possible? So uh, that is the like a frame for discussion. And I'm delighted to have a wonderful panel. Let me very quickly introduce them. Uh, I have with me uh, Sujata Sahu. She is the founder of 17,000 Feet uh, with a mission to transforming uh, lives in rural Ladakh. She has also been instrumental in helping shape their education strategy. And I must say an organization with probably the most scenic uh, 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 place to like work with. So welcome, you welcome Sajata. Thank you. Uh, we also have uh, Saurav Banerjee. Saurav is the country director for Room to Read, uh, one of the most prominent not-for-profits working on the issue of literacy and girls' education. Welcome Saurav. And finally, the third panelist for the day, uh, we have uh, Maharshi Vashna from Educate Girls. Uh, Educate Girls, as you know, is focused on improving outcomes for the girl child. So uh, with this, like, let me very, very quickly go to the first panelist. And again, in no particular order, so maybe we can start with you, Sujata. Sujata, as you think about like, how COVID-19 is uh, impacting your external organization, okay? you talk about, like, say, the projects that you were working on. Uh, how are you just dealing with it? Could you just give me a, give the, uh, the entire, uh, uh, people, the ecosystem which is watching, a little bit of a frame about how 17,000 feet is trying to deal with this external situation. Okay, cool. First of all, uh, this is a great uh, forum. Thanks to the Nudge and CSF and Tel Foundation for having this. So, yeah, I work in scenic Ladakh, and the, the, the not so scenic part of it is uh, that Ladakh is actually extremely rural and remote. 90% of it is rural. We don't have uh, the infrastructure that most of the other urban or even some of the other rural areas can claim. So I possibly work in the areas which have uh, absolutely no roads, no electricity, no connectivity. So you can just imagine how tough our work is. So in general, most of our projects involve going to the villages. So we work with about 220 very remote villages across Ladakh. And as the name itself suggests, 17,000 feet, we are going to work with uh, villages which are absolutely inaccessible and across uh, high mountain terrain. So having given you a bit of the background about how Ladakh is, so <clears throat> the, what, uh, two of the projects, main projects that we do is we want to transform the lives of people who live in these communities so they don't have to migrate. And one of the core reasons for their migration is education. So there is a government school in every single village of Ladakh. And it doesn't matter even if there's 50 children or 20, there is a government school there, which is a fantastic thing. But the problem is that communities or parents usually feel that the government school isn't good enough and for obvious reasons. So they tend to migrate. So most of our work revolves around going to the school, improving infrastructure, talking to the communities, training teachers, working with the government on policies and, and procedures that they can implement. 
So things were going fine. If we even digitized quite a few schools, but provided solar electricity, and we were said, okay, we managed to digitize 120 schools in such a remote area. And that was quite a big achievement, and along comes COVID. So, and like you rightly said, it has disrupted pretty much everything. And I think I won't be alone when I say that it has disrupted our work to the largest uh, level. So if you look at now physically going to the schools, like I said, there's no other way for us to do much, we physically go to the school. That has been disrupted in a large way. We can't do much by way of, so most of our infrastructure projects, our teacher training projects are, uh, have been come down to a standstill. Even our community workshops that we do are at a standstill. And you have to understand there isn't even telephone connectivity in these areas. So everybody talking about ed tech and mobile and SMS and WhatsApp, it's a far cry. So, but having said this, there, like, like you all know, the schools have stopped. So, but we have been, we have, there's no other way but to go back and look at how can we still continue to support the communities that we work in? And they are facing issues. One is interrupted education. The, and there are other as well. They're also looking, they're dealing with cases of COVID which could potentially reach their villages. So a couple of few initiatives that we're working on right now is, um, so we've been working with teachers, those that have access to WhatsApp. And these are the teachers who would have come in possibly to the cities before, uh, before COVID started. And I have to also say one more thing. The one more unique thing about Ladakh is Ladakh schools have been shut since December. So they're looking at a loss of education now already for five and a half months and potentially three more. So many teachers in the cities, we've been working with them, suggesting lessons and lesson plans in which that they can even work temporarily with maybe the 20 or 30% of students who have access to this. We are also working a very fantastic initiative. We've realized that education, uh, we can't rely on ed tech. We can't rely on digital. There's no electricity in all these villages. So uh, the one thing that, the teachers specifically in Cargill district have done is we are working to create audio lessons, video lessons, I'm sorry. And this is, uh, and they're doing a fantastic job of it. So what 17,000 feet has done is we've regularized the whole thing that to put it into a good framework in which, uh, see when it comes, when, whenever schools open, whenever schools open, they will have access to these videos in whatever form, maybe in their TV on a pen drive, or, or for those people who are online. But as of now, there are a mix of initiatives going on, but edtech's not working completely. It's not going to work. But that said, the, these teacher communities are creating an asset base of hundreds of videos in various languages. And it is, it is in the local dialect, so it helps the child learn quite a bit. We're also, um, the, the other thing is, of course, uh, our communities are severely affected. So we're now putting together a massive outreach program. Our schools are not prepared for this outbreak. So one of the sure. early things we decided is uh, education may be disrupted, but we have to prepare for the future. And when I say future, I mean short-term future and the long-term. We see a lot of changes happening. But while doing so, we also are helping the community in their immediate needs. Where sure. we're uh, working with the administration and health supplies and hygiene supplies and so on. So that's, uh, that's basically a little bit of uh, what we are doing. So thanks, thanks, Sujata, like very comprehensively like laid it out, et cetera. Let me go over to Saurabh. Saurabh, like Room to Read runs some of the largest uh, programs on early learning in the country, for example. Like how are you dealing with, for example, like say this tremendous disruption in the external environment? We know the governments are struggling with trying to like, make sense of like what to do, what not to do. So if you could give a little bit about like how have Room to Read's plan uh, 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 external with the government across the country that's like, been affected with it, of course. And what are you doing uh, to mitigate that? Uh, thank, sorry, I was muted. So um, thank you uh, for giving the opportunity and thank you, Praveen, for raising this question. So as you rightly said, Room to Read has been largely working on the early grade literacy space and the girls' education space. And as an organization, we are not really an organization who were very tech focused in that way. Our most of our programs were like in the school with the teacher, with the family, that kind of program. So, uh, so it's it was a very uh, very close interaction with the community teacher, uh, and especially focused on the school. So obviously, when this COVID thing struck, it was. It was a big challenge because the schools closed out and all our activities were actually in the school. So uh, uh, 
so we kind of uh, for the first few days i i i would admit that we were quite at a loss that uh, what what is to be done now if the schools are now closed uh, but uh, but thankfully uh, uh, rumkreet also being a big organization uh, has a certain amount of resilience so i think there was one track of room to read which was already working on a digitization plan of how you kind of digitize a lot of products that we offer to the school so what we did uh, was uh, we kind of fast track that so a lot so so post covid what happened there was one section of our staff and uh, program team who was working on on fast tracking the digitization efforts so that included things like you know digitizing our story books so that they can be accessible over video over television over uh, whatsapp and what not uh, developing audio uh, audio capsules audio lessons which can be transmitted over the radio we are using community radio also at at the places uh, also uh, also looking at the, on the girls education space we developed uh, life skill lessons which can be transmitted to the girls over either a phone or or a digital platform so a part of the team was was on that but the other part of the team was more uh, more uh, working towards disseminating this products over various channels so obviously uh, the first option was governments and 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 you're right that a lot of the governments have been and very proactive in getting their act together and i was just here hearing uh, uh, lokesh yatta talking in the other panel and and this is state like mp powerter or up i mean the way they have just turned around get got their act together is phenomenal and and so they have and chatisgarh also i mean they have activated various whatsapp channels right down to the parent level so in a way uh, it kind of helped our work because then you could ride on to those channels and disseminate your your program uh, but at the same time at the same time there were uh, there were cases where there were not uh, adequate channels available like uttarakhand is a case where we had to rely on the community radio because being a hilly state uh, network connectivity is a problem uh, so we we focused more and and community radio thankfully in that state is very strong so we okay. we took the community radio route so so the other part of our team was actually figuring out what is the best way to disseminate this content and then then kind of get to the teachers uh, this part of the team was also trying to uh, get in touch with the parents the teachers with a regular interaction kya chal raha hai how can you help you what kind of content you read and all of that thing which is very necessary in this kind of situation because maybe everyone is very confused uh, in the process what we also uh, realized and i mean it's not uh, everybody realizes that that tech in spite of all its uh, all its good uh, uh, positives you you cannot still reach everyone through tech I mean, in the morning anurag was talking and even in delhi the uh, spread the reach is only about 40% of the parents yeah. have a smartphone so forget that in many other remote uh, remote states so so we are what we are also doing is also working on a on a offline package which is basically a group, a kind of set of self instructional materials which the sure. child can take home which can be given to the child the parent and they can can they, they can do a lot of learning at home whether it's okay. the early grade student or the girl 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 student and i think going forward that's that's what i see happening because even once the schools open it's not going to be a 100 person schooling happening everywhere because yeah. it might open up in a green zone tomorrow the green zone may become a red zone and you have to shut it off again and so you have to go so you have to go in this online offline mode for quite some time now so sure. i think that the focus now is to prepare for that that eventuality going forward okay great thank you thank you so much sarov and okay also that thanks for a reality check i think digital divide is something that like sometimes it is like say you know Uh, it becomes a blind spot for a lot of us. Uh, let me go to the third panelist for the day, uh, Maharshi. Uh, again, um, Educate Girls is an organization which works both in school and outside school, serving some of the like both in terms of the target segment, the girls, and also the kind of areas that it works in. Uh, how has it impacted your program, Maharshi? Uh, Excuse me, sir. 
All right, before I begin, uh, thanks so much for this opportunity. It's it's great. Uh, congratulations to Nudge, uh, CSF, and MSDF. It's been incredible gathering. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, Educate Girls, as the name suggests, we focus on enrollment, retention, learning, and life skills of girls, right? Uh, pretty much similar to what Room to Read does on the life skills side. Uh, we work in very rural, very remote, uh, tribal, uh, underserved villages um, in Rajasthan, in MP, and very recently in, in UP as well. Um, so, uh, you know, we go from identifying each and every girl who's out of uh, school, uh, you know, working closely with the community and the local administration to ensure that the girl uh, is in school, and we ensure that she doesn't drop out. And then, of course, learning and life skills uh, set in. And for this, we have a very heavy uh, boots on the ground kind of a presence. So uh, each and every village has a community volunteer. And then for every six to eight villages is our first paid position. And then the hierarchy uh, builds upward. So as we speak, we are present in, in about uh, 17 or 1,000 villages. And, and about uh, uh, these villages have about 30, a little over 30,000 schools. And to take care of these uh, villages and schools, we have uh, about uh, almost 1,800 employees and about 14 and a half thousand community volunteers. So we have a large setup uh, uh, from from you know community outreach uh, perspective. Uh, now uh, this you know we were not prepared for this obviously. This just hit us uh, uh, you know out of the blue. Uh, fortunately, however, what happened was we were in the very last fortnight of our program cycle of our program year. The 1920 academic year was just about coming to an end. And you know, so was our program cycle. So we lost about two to three weeks worth of programmatic uh, work in the field. But apart from that, the the impact on us programmatically, project-wise, hasn't been very significant. Where uh, it's it's uh, making us uh, rethink uh, our intervention, uh, rethink the way we uh, deploy our resources on the ground, the way we train communities, and you know, our team members. Um, uh, is that we have very quickly, uh, we've been forced to very quickly pivot to digital. So all our field teams, anyway, we used to provide them with uh, smartphones because our program villages and schools are geotagged and, and you know, we, we capture data on the field on mobile phones, et cetera. So that training has very quickly shifted to, you know, Zoom for business and WhatsApp for business. So it's, it's, it's a very smooth transition where we are now going to face challenges in, in working with communities. Because as, as, as you know, Sarov mentioned, smartphone penetration is, is, is very uh, minimal. We had done a survey uh, last year and less than 20% parents, and that too, male parents, so father or, or, or the elder brother would have a smartphone. So, uh, so, so that is going to be a challenge. Uh, the second thing is our door-to-door, -door, the, the census where we identify each and every out-of-school girl, that has got stalled. So yeah. our expansion in Uttar Pradesh, which was in the Bundelkhand region, um, the prerequisite for that was we would identify each and every girl who's out of school. So that isn't happening as we speak. But uh, but then, you know, we are hopeful that once, uh, uh, you know, schools or, or rather communities reopen, schools uh, may reopen a little later, we will still be able to do it fairly quickly. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, the, so the impact has been uh, fairly minimal as of now. However, uh, depending on the extent of the lockdown, uh, and you know, when schools reopen, we'll have to rethink. Great, uh, and thank, thank Marishi for bringing out the issue of enrollment. Also, I remember listening to Dr. Banerjee, uh, Rukmini Banerjee from Pratham, and she mentioned that you no, know, at some level, at a policy level, we had almost thought that the battle for enrollment is won. However, I think states would need to rethink about like what is the impact, not only on the learning which I think like everyone is worried about, but also on like ensuring that students uh, enrolled in schools as well as attend regularly. And I think like both are like slightly separate like issues, et cetera. Uh, and thanks to all the panelists, et cetera, I think you brought it wonderfully off like how you are trying to deal with this, uh, uh, with this massive, uh, 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 like an external shock almost, et cetera. But if I just like, take a little bit of a, like a step back as well as go a little bit internal into your organizations. So, uh, how are you, as leaders of these organizations, uh, what is your decision-making framework about both on the harder stuff? You know, we talk about financials, we talk about employee retention, we talk about like what to do, what not to do, and also about softer stuff, like you know, being able to do something for the community, like being able to serve uh, about employee morale, etc. So, just as leaders, 
uh, of these organizations like how do you like how are you even like say, thinking about doing it etc especially around the decision making framework so uh, and let me go in the reverse order so maybe maybe like i can if i can start with you how's educate girls internally thinking and dealing with it so so as i mentioned um, we have a very large workforce in the field right uh, and and um, you know the geography is where we operate and talent is anyway very sparse so the ones that we have managed to get on board ones that we have trained are you know aligned on values etc we want to take care of them so our priority one immediately once the government announced the lockdown was obviously shut all offices but was to was to look after them so within within you know two uh, days we set up a 24/7 helpline for our employees which basically uh, uh, you know provides you know physical psychological uh, financial material support to all our employees uh, that was the first one the first thing that we did then we had uh, our, our founder ceo uh, record a message a video message which was then circulated widely across you know whatsapp and and emails to all our employees where we basically reassured them that you know they are not going to lose their jobs they're not going to uh, face any salary cuts uh, and once once the uh, uh, you know the lockdown or the situation improves then we'll be back on uh, you know back on track so reassuring them that you know they don't need to necessarily get get any uh, uh, you know any more concern the third thing that we did which was fairly unprecedented even by educate girls standard was uh, immediately we uh, so so the workforce that i mentioned about uh, the 1800 odd employees out of that a little over 1500 actually worked in the villages and are, are are at you know state prescribed minimum wage plus mobile allowance plus traveling allowance etc so they so they they don't necessarily make that kind you know very high salaries so for all employees who make less than uh, uh, you know 20000 a month basically we announced a, a top up an immediate top up of 5000 rupees so you know almost 1600 employees uh, got 5000 in their bank uh, accounts straight away um so we said this is the least that we could do uh, in times of uncertainty and you know take care of them so that was on the employees side of things sure on the community side uh, uh and because we have very deep ties with the community and you know we have the the coordinates of all sarpanches and ward punches you know but you, employees are actually sorry sorry community i actually want to go six separately i just want to keep at least this one like at an organization level yeah. uh, like thanks thanks again for sharing and yeah, yeah. for Like a being a like a compassionate organization. A sort of over to you. Uh, how how is room to rate internally uh, like dealing with it? Sorry. Again. Uh, um, sorry. Again. Uh, room to rate being a big organization, a kind of a global organization for it, for what you may call it. It has both its pros and cons, I guess. Uh, on the pro side, I guess uh, the the strongest thing is that you you have a certain level of resilience, as I said. I mean, there is this sense of community. This is the large community. We are in it together. Uh, you you have a huge employee base, so there are people to lean upon each other. People are kind of uh, working together. Uh, we also have a strong people operations department. So this whole thing about there was a specific department. dedicatedly working towards how to keep the people happy how to retain their moral how to have regular team meetings how to have regular catch ups with them so so that that part i think was well taken care of and that has not been much of a problem uh, but on the flip side again since it's a big organization so you know the team required to run the engine is also big so so and and this uh, these times where Where funding is likely to be a problem. I mean, we heard it since morning that uh, the funding of for the non-profit sector is going to be a challenge, and it's not only this year; it's going to be years after. So, so that was the challenging part on how to really uh, how to kind of cater for for the future years. And and I think what happened was uh, in this process that we we became very innovative and we we tried to look at. because again uh, similar to educate girls since since we were kind of certain that we are not going to kind of touch our staff and not kind of get not lay off or losing jobs so that is definitely not a not a something that we are considering so we looked inwards so we looked at our systems our processes how they can be streamlined how we can cut the flap there how can you can make bring in more automation how we can make 
those systems more effective that you so that you start saving money, which then can be plowed back onto the program. So that's that's I would say is has been our effort. great. Thanks, thanks a lot, Sautar. Uh, Sujata. Yes, I'm happy to be the outlier in this group. So unlike Educate Girls in Room to Read, we are not a very large organization. We have a very large geographic presence of 60,000 square kilometers where we work in, but so our perspective is very different. So yeah, um, this thing took everyone by surprise and financially, definitely we were not prepared for it. So this was something, so one of the biggest things I had to face as the leader, I think my the first month was the hardest for me. I mean, we've had to take really hard decisions it is not about letting people go as much as we've had to uh, put people on furlough. So now to having to take that decision, how much will your cash flow last? And knowing very well, like sort of just said, funding is going to become very difficult for this year, maybe until the end of next year. So um, we've had to take certain decisions in terms of what were the key tasks that we did not want, which were not critical at this point. So we put a couple of those projects, administrative, like technical projects on hold. And when it came to the people, so we had a discussion internally within the board and with the entire staff. And I'm talking of the field staff as well. So you see the, the, the key part, if I, I would put something a little bit differently. I think our resilience comes from the fact that because we are very small. But what has happened here is we have a very small team. We're about 30 plus strong. And these are all most of them of our Ladakis. And what has happened, we took a collective decision that yes, we have to, what is foremost, uh, most important was that we continue to do the work and support the communities that we work in. Towards that effect, if we need to continue to do this, keeping the organization and the spirit of work alive, we took a collective decision to take pay cuts within ourselves. So, but then also the good thing that did happen that some of our funders and our board members themselves came forward and they, uh, they, they tried to pitch in in ways in which we could help our team members. So. Uh, the, I think the most amazing thing that I've seen in our organization is how our teams uh, from uh, the ground have said they will support and they are more aware of what is likely to happen to their communities and how they are more needed than ever. They were willing to work without pay. They were willing to come in and until the organization got kicked back on its feet. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was... Um, yeah, the one key decision also we took in that we had to go back and look at, all right, we are working in education, we are working in community. Um, our, our digital programs, like, like sort of said, uh, though we had digitized and we have actually an offline online solution, but it still required somebody to come into the school, but we could not, uh, we could not execute them because everyone was stuck at home. So we had to go back to the drawing board and say, do we get into something else? I mean, do we still continue to... Um, support our communities and that is where we took a call as to also uh, help the government help the local administration reach out to these communities because that's what we're good at we have such a deep rooted presence so um we have now expanded programmatically and we continue to, to support uh, this and this too shall pass we're quite confident of that and uh, thanks Sujata, uh, and thanks to all the panelists uh let me just open the floor for questions and i see there are a couple of hands so uh, Nomita, uh, if you could like, you know, uh, like say your questions. And ideally, what we would want to do is just collect a few questions, etc., and then like have, go back to the panel. So, Nomita, would you go ahead with your question? Uh, okay, I don't see a question from anyone. Uh, like, are they, sorry, like, let me, let me just like, reframe. Are there any questions? Okay, so yeah, like someone asked a question that what are the future plans six to months like looking like? So, uh, and let me add a little bit on that, et cetera. And I think till other questions come in. Uh, if you put a little bit of a thinking hat on to what six to eight months would look like, and even like what this year and next year would look like, what are the things that you think would change because of COVID? And what are the things that people think would change but would like, return back to the normal? And like, let's keep it a slightly like a quick <laughs> question and I'll hold you accountable to your guesses maybe after a year. So uh, maybe like sort of if I can start with you, what are the things that would change? What are the things which won't? 
Uh, I think quite a bit would change. Uh, the the school system, as you as we have seen till now, we would undergo quite change. At least uh, in the short and medium term. I am not guessing for the long term. I see it will come back to uh, to the earlier stage, stage. But at least in the short short and medium term, I think the the key change that's going to happen is you'll have. Uh, less and less uh, physical instruction time happening in the classroom. So they will, due to social distancing, due to the fact that they will be off and on, schools will be open and closed. So, so, so that's going to be a reality at least for the next one, one and a half year. And, and so uh, for our six to eight months plan is basically preparing for that. And as I said, I mean, it's, so we're looking at a offline plus online kind of a package going forward. We are looking at a package which is, uh, which also considers that fact that teaching now is not going to happen only in the school, but also in the home. So, so, so and the, keeping in mind the fact that the child is also going to be taught at home. So parents are also to be co-opted in this process of teaching. And it's not only the teachers, so there are, there, there are activities that you need to do with the parents as well as the teachers. So that that would be my short answer to that. Sure. Let me go to like you know uh, Marshi, you and there's yeah. an actually interesting question that maybe like before we go into the future like, like crystal gazing etc. You could answer, which is that how do you engage a purely field based organization? And I know like you know, educate girls has a like large field force etc. What are some of the ways in which you think that an organization which is like pretty professionally like run and managed etc is able to engage with a large field force, multiple geographies, et cetera. Uh, so I would, I would echo sort of sentiment that, you know, we'll see some, some drastic shifts that will happen for the, for the near term, near to medium term, but in the long term, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll all fall back to normalcy. On uh, engaging with the field team. So uh, all our field staff, as I mentioned, have uh, Android, uh, you know, uh, operating system smartphones. And, and you know, there's an edu educate girls app on their phone as well, uh, on their phones as well, preloaded, and we use it extensively to collect data and to exchange information, etc. But that alone, we realized, is not going to be enough. So therefore, we we basically created uh, uh, smaller uh, groups, uh, geography-wise, function-wise, interest-wise, on 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 you know, Zoom for uh, on WhatsApp for business, and then we use either WhatsApp for business and Zoom for business for uh, for you know, exchanging ideas and information. But that's not all. What we have done is we have also got uh, got a mentor uh, for our team. Uh, he's he's based in San Francisco, but but uh, and he's he's great at at you know team and you know uh, team dynamics and you know org behavior, org behavior and org culture and all. And every Thursday, we have uh, you know learning with Judah. I mean, his name is Judah Pollock. He's he's a Silicon Valley based mentor and and one of our uh, one of our funders uh, was very gracious to suggest him to us in the pre-COVID times. But then, you know, we thought we leverage this, this lockdown and, and, and get him on board. So every Thursday we have a le learning session with him. So, you know, from uh, a geography, uh, function and interest based uh, smaller groups that we have created, which meet uh, periodically every week to, you know, getting a mentor on board. Uh, we are keeping them engaged, uh, largely uh, using mobile devices. Great. And there's one, uh, thanks, thanks, Mahishi. There's one question about, and I think like, you know, Sujata, if you could take a shot at it, et cetera, which is to say that what are the kind of programs that you envision, like say morphing, which would continue in short to medium term? And what are the programs that you might want to morph from a medium term? How are you targeting about beneficiary? So I think this goes a little bit into your decision making. I know this is like slightly more particular, but like say for an organization like 17,000 Feet Foundation, what is your decision making framework of how would you prioritize like say A versus B versus C? So, um, yeah, so you see there's one thing that's happening specifically in the case of Ladakh. Uh, what's going to happen with a lot of, um, Ladakh depends a lot on tourism, correct? So with the tourism going to take a deep hit, most of the people or parents or, uh, who have migrated to the cities for education are, are going to move back to the villages. This is actually going to put increased pressure on the government school system as well, not just in terms of infrastructure and teacher resources, but also in terms of the learning. There's going to be a language gap, there's going to be a learning gap and so on. So if you, interestingly for us, when we looked at our existing programs, we were anyway looking at one of our, the big, one of our metrics for measuring how successful our program was to see, where have we been able to reduce student migration from the villages into the cities? Now, 
because of COVID, we're seeing that it is anyway going to happen at least in the next year to two years. And after situations normalize, it may move again. So the need for our programs has now become even more so. So our programs still stay relevant. But the one thing that I think we need to add on, and it's a very critical need at this point, is to bring in the community involvement. We need to up this a lot more. I think Saurav had also mentioned this one, which is, you see, with, with so much of in time and out time in terms of the lockdown and social distancing, and so a lot of the learning has moved into the household. We yeah. need to work a little longer and harder with the communities. We're not talking about education, but we're talking about the need for the parents to be sensitive about the, for the children to learn. So the, I won't look at anything morphing, in, in my case, at least in the case of 17,000 feet, but I think what we would critically add on for sure is uh, how do we work with communities to help them support this influx of more children into the government schools, maybe their own children from private schools to government school. It's going to be a hard transition for them. So for the next six to eight months this is what we're going to do. And with the hope to sustaining this migration, in this case, we say the migration is a good thing. So if these people have actually moved back to their villages, it's a good thing. So that is what we are going to look at. So actually, on the migration question, there is a very interesting, let's say, question slash observation uh, by uh, uh, Fiona, ma'am, which is like, say, you know, migrant workers, and we've all seen the both the distress migration as well as the like a like a heartening pictures of migrants moving back to their families. What is going to happen to education in the government schools? Like someone, and again, I don't have an answer, but you know, this is something that even I was exploring, uh, like most of the migrant in India is actually male migration. So if you, for example, like here, people who studied migration, like Chinmay, Tumbe, IMA, uh, most of the migration is not, actually not the family migration. It is the male migrants from like, uh, Eastern states of India, UP, Bihar, migrating in search of jobs. Uh, how much of it is like, for example, like floating children population? I don't think so. We collect a system level data on that. I know there are pockets of organizations which have done that. But yeah, I think this is something. And again, if some of you have any observations on the migration part uh, 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 to uh, say about how this would, for example, impact schooling going forward, like would love to have that. But I think on a system level, this is something that like say we are struggling with, which is completely unprecedented. Like because you shut down the economy and people have temporarily, and maybe in some cases for an extended period, gone back home. Uh, I don't know if some of you, uh, I know like, like Mershi and sort of uh, uh, in the areas that you work in, if you are seeing something. Yeah, I can go on that. So, uh, so migration, uh, we, have ha we have been actually working on migration for some time, not yeah. due to the COVID situation. I mean, this is of course a specific different Language. kind of a migration. But in large areas of central India, Madhya Pradesh, you have these large families migrating out uh, yeah. to Maharashtra, to, uh, to those places for job, for, uh, uh, for various other reasons. So even in our programs in Madhya Pradesh, if I, if I may say, a large, uh, significant part of the instruction time the children had just migrated out. So we were anyway trying to struggle with how to deal with those children. And, and we were anyway thinking of having our packages or kits which you can give to the children while they're migrating uh, so that they are at least there to minimize the learning loss, I would say. I mean, you really can't get them into full stream education systems unless the place where they're migrating to also has a, you have a tie up with that, those governments. That's, that's the systemic level uh, integration. But on, on a programmatic level, what we were trying to see is if we can have kids uh, that we give to the families, which will minimize the le learning loss. Of course, the COVID migration is a bit different because here yeah. you have a group of people who has just come back to the uh, village. Now, there are various layers to that. There are various layers in the sense that one, it would put some bit of pressure on the village school, which had probably 20 kids till now. Suddenly it has an influx of another 20 kids. And there's only one teacher or not even a teacher. And so how do they yeah. manage that? So there's a management issue there. There's an issue of, uh, of also expectations and, uh, and the fact that many of these kids should probably be coming from the cities and how they gel with the, with the village uh, population. Uh, there's some more uh, sociological issues that needs to be studied and seen how, how that works out. Sure. Uh, those are things I think uh, I can envisage right now of areas that we need to work on. 
no an excellent point i think you know uh, if like say 6 months down the line we were to check how adaptive were our education systems one of the criteria would be how quickly were we able to redistribute our teachers keeping in mind the student population like yeah. like that's one of the like a toughest things to do uh, maharshi you had a yeah. quick observation and we have 5 minutes so maybe we'll no. just take one question after that yeah on the migration bit i'll take a minute more so you know there is this tectonic shift that's happening right there's this reverse migration that's happening and a lot of men are returning back to the villages so the immediate feedback that we are getting from our uh, village based field team at uh, cases of uh, domestic violence and child abuse have significantly shot up in our villages uh, in our program villages because they are back home there's lot loss of employment and income streams and also there's overall stress and you know you know it's it's just getting very difficult so we uh, fear you know it's going to get increasingly difficult for girls to return to school sure and uh, like with this i think like you know like let me go to the closing uh, uh, comments to our panelists etc and there i would want you to answer two questions like one is if you want to advise either policy makers school principals etc about opening up the schools how would that opening up of school look like like how should they th- i mean in just one advice if suppose you were to dole it out to uh, uh, school principals whether those are private public etc how should they think about the entire academic year or whatever would be left to it based on where we are right now that's one and second as a leader how are you managing yourself because again like uh, everyone looks up to the leadership to steady the ship Uh, as like LinkedIn like talked about, how are you dealing with it, and how are you trying to like you know keep safe? So yeah, uh, we have three minutes. So I'll just like hold you to one minute per participant. Uh, maybe like Sujata, if you can go ahead. Sure. My first thing would be to headmasters and teachers. So one thing I would want to say is, you go back to school, think of the child and not of the syllabus. And I think the big thing we're going to see is. if and when they open there's going to be this mad rush to oh i have to finish because they're, they're very stressed the teachers are stressed and uncertain facing uncertain times themselves so my first thing would be that just connect with the child because they themselves don't know what the children have gone through so i would say that and how i am dealing with it uh it's been stressful um meditate i actually started meditating i used to do this a long time back and i have to say my stresses have come back so i spent some time meditating a little bit and listening to music that helps that helps i look at old photographs of children in in ladakh that really helps oh well uh sarav uh so on the school opening i think uh the advice would be again as i said we work on a system whereby you you almost work on a 50% capacity of instruction so what to work with the schools to uh to to kind of set a realistic set of expectations of outcomes what you can expect in this year and the year next and then work towards that with a as i said with a with a home plus school kind of a uh, structure uh on how um from the leadership side i think a couple of things one of course is the big change for everybody from the organization level from right from the person who is working at the field level his job has changed to the person who is working in the country level so i think as a leadership it is very important as for us to uh, first accept the change acknowledge the change and then manage the change uh, so i think that that's a very uh, very uh, core part of what we are doing as the as the, as the leadership Uh, being empathetic is part of that whole process because uh, acknowledging everybody is going through stress and so how you can how you can be by by their side uh, is to the extent possible at a personal level i think uh, one of the things that i have learned during this time is the skill of multitasking i mean i was never very good at it <laughs> i was very concentrated on work job and then move to the next but now you know with this housework and children and work i have like become an expert in multitasking i would say <laughs> thanks thanks adam uh, amarshi so uh very quickly uh, dr banerji rukmini banerji mentioned something very uh, important this morning i'm just going to repeat that i mean you know this is a, a recommendation to principals don't worry too much about learning outcomes and curriculum or have course khatam karna hai don't worry about it please don't take your eyes off inclusion varna jo ye pichle do uh, decades mein jo kaam hua hai on on getting children into school it will just get undone so let's not lose our eyes uh, lose our sight on 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 the inclusion on the enrollment ball so that's one 
on the personal front, there's so much of overload of information that's happening. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. you know, emails and WhatsApp universe and television and all. So I what I have started doing, and it's it's only been a week now. Um, I just lock myself in a room without gadgets, and I don't do anything. I just sit down on the floor actually here, and I don't do anything. I just sit down. That's all I do. And that's what has, has started uh, having a calming effect on me. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, like very, very unexpected and very, very different answer from all three of you. Uh, 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 thanks. Thanks so much for like being yeah. here on the Friday evening uh, for this wonderful discussion. Thanks for the audience. I know this was a like late Friday evening session like for participating. I'm sorry we couldn't take all the questions, but yeah, that's it. Uh, 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 thanks, thanks for joining.